Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to the Equitarian Initiative. This is a virtual program about working donkeys, mules, and horses in the developing world. Um, you may know that there are millions of donkeys, mules, and horses that labor daily across the globe, and we're going to learn about their working conditions, the essential contributions to their owners and communities, and the complex and myriad social and cultural factors that are all involved in, in their labor. Uh, Granby resident Dr. Harry W. Werner will share his firsthand experience with the volunteer team of veterinarians, surgeons, vet techs, animal scientists, farriers, and students who deliver basic and advanced veterinary care and uh, health care to, um, to all these working equids. Uh, a little bit more about Dr. Werner because I don't think we can um, proceed without sharing some of, some of his background. Um, Dr. Werner has practiced equine medicine and surgery since his 1974 graduation from the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. And for more than 40 years, he owned Werner Equine. And in 2020, Werner Equine merged with Grand Prix Equine, where he is now a consultant. I can share with you that Dr. Werner helped to initiate the International Forum for Working Equids with the BIVA president, Chris House. Now BIVA stands for British Equine Veterinary Association. Um, and so he's participated in Project Samana, the Dominican Republic Equitarian Program. And he also served the World Equine Veterinary, or he served in the World Equine Veterinary Association as a director and a treasurer. So he has also been elected to the International Equine Veterinarians Hall of Fame. That was in 2013 and he's received Distinguished Service Awards um, and other honors. And in 2015, he was chosen as Connecticut Veterinarian of the Year. In 2020, the American Veterinary Medical Association presented Dr. Werner with its Animal Welfare Award. And this award recognizes achievement in advancing the welfare of animals via leadership, public service, education, research, product development, and advocacy. And having said all that, I'm sure his head is like this right now, <laughs> um, but, but we are very excited to have such a um, expert in the field and someone with firsthand experience um, from the ground up in, in the Equitarian Initiative and what goes on in this, this, this whole organization. And so having said all those wonderful things about Dr. Warner, I'm going to turn the program over to him now. So let's give a warm virtual welcome for Dr. Harry Werner. Harry, take it away. Thank you, Holly. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone. Um, it, I'm delighted to uh, be able to present this information to you. I consider uh, I consider this uh, an opportunity for myself and a privilege because this particular subject is is very um, important to me, uh, and I want to uh, do my best so that when we're all done this evening, uh, it causes some reflection and thought on your part as well. So thank you, Holly. <clears throat> Thank you to the Friends of the Cosset Library for supporting the speaker program, and uh, my thanks to the Equitarian Initiative, which we'll explain in a moment for the wonderful work that they do uh, globally. A couple definitions here. <clears throat> we talk about working equids. Why don't we talk about working equines? Well, equids are donkeys, mules, and horses. Technically speaking, you could also add zebras, but they're not working. So equids is a kind of catch-all term for donkeys, mules, and horses. Equine uh, is limited to horses. And why do we care about working equids? Well, these animals in the developing world work day in and day out. Sometimes still they drop, literally. They sustain communities throughout the developing world, most of these communities impoverished by our standards. When we help them, when we help the working equids, and we educate their owners, 
we help the entire community. So please understand that from the get go, this is not a be kind to animals lecture, uh, although certainly that's part of it, but it speaks to a broader social mission that involves both the animals and their owners and the uh, inseparable relationship between the two. Now, for many of my 46 plus years in practice, I and others used the word performance horses. Oh yes, I have a performance horse. He plays polo or he races as a standard bred or thoroughbred or he's a stadium jumper or a dressage horse or an event horse. Well, those are performance horses, uh, I'd agree. But when I began to see firsthand the working equids of the third world, it occurred to me immediately that they are another category of performance horse. And I would argue uh, if either group deserved the term performance more, it's, it's the working equids of the third world. Um, these three uh, equids are, they work in the Dominican Republic. As you can see hauling bananas, firewood, people. Um, this is a working equid from Ethiopia hauling stones. And here we have an equid from the brick kilns of Cairo, Egypt, um, sadly being asked more than, he, than it is capable of doing. And, and there's nothing uncommon about that. So it's important to understand that these equids as I said, they have an inseparable relationship with their owners and they facilitate human labor. They allow humans to work more efficiently, but with that comes conflict with equid welfare if things are not monitored carefully. And I would say in these four images, I don't see too much well of welfare concern. Um, on the right, those images look like an awful lot of baggage, but it's either hay or straw, not terrible, not too heavy. Um, so they, I'm sorry, so they, uh, their relief of the human burden helps these, these communities at least survive, if not thrive. And the equids do it by transport. Here's a man transporting water. Uh, they do, they'll transport commercial items, they'll transport farm goods. They'll pull, which, is, which of course is plowing and pulling as you can see here. Um, and so this is how they relieve the human burden. They facilitate the lives, uh, improvement in the lives of their owners. Here are some more images. Um, you can see again, carrying people, pulling draft loads. But there are problems. And what are the problems? Well, there are health problems. This horse on the lower left luxated its proximal interphalangeal joint at some point in the past. This is in the Dominican Republic. I actually examined this horse. Um, it had fused just as you, if you had gone in for surgical fusion and that horse was continuing to work up and down the hillside in the rainforest, bringing, carrying coconuts, big, big, big saddlebags of coconuts. The other horse here had a so-called degloving injury. These horses don't get time off. Uh, malnutrition and parasitism, intestinal parasitism are, are a big problem. And you look at the very low body condition score on that horse. Infectious diseases. The horse at the top is excoriating itself. It's tearing the skin off its legs from rabies. The horse on the bottom right, um, if you look at the left hind leg, the enormity of it, that's a horse suffering from uh, epizootic lymphangitis. And when, it, when epizootic lymphangitis uh, appears in its very early stages, it can be remedied with antibiotics, 
but if there, there aren't too many antibiotics in the rainforest or diagnosticians, this horse, uh, there's no hope for that horse. And then if you look upper left and lower right, these are again our brick kiln horses. Uh, I would tell you right up that the brick kiln environment is probably of all the world's global equids, this is probably the toughest environment for them. So who's helping these animals? Well, there's a list of non-government organizations. Um, and here it is, these are excellent, legitimate, ethical, self-sacrificing organizations and people that work for them. Some of them are, are rather venerable. The Brook, for example, is into its 80 some years uh, old. They have interesting histories. Um, and if anybody at any point wants to learn more about them at the end of this, you, is my uh, contact, you can, you can get a hold of me. I'll be happy to direct you. So a dozen years ago, perhaps, um, people involved and in, uh, concerned about these working equids formed what is called the Equitarian Initiative. Um, it is what it says, philanthropic veterinary care for the working horses of the developing world. And there's, their, uh, there's a, the website of the Equitarian Initiative. And I would strongly encourage you to visit that. It's got a ton of information. The vision is a world where every working horse, donkey, and mule receives basic health care. We're not talking anything fancy here, but essentially uh, the care to which we feel they are entitled as, as, wor as working animals. The mission, I would point out two key points in the mission. The first is volunteer veterinarians worldwide. Um, and it's not just veterinarians, it's technicians, it's what you or I would call horse people, that is experienced horse people who can travel to a place, a distant place, and assist the medical and surgical care of these animals. Um, and then to empower their care providers, and this is education to empower their care providers for sustainable change. It does no good to travel to a, to a developing world country, uh, suture a wound, uh, geld a stallion, turn around and come home. What the, 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 the heart of the mission is the education and therefore the empowerment of the owners and the caregivers. In the upper left, that's in the, in the colored shirt, that's Dr. J. Merriam. He, he was one of the founders of the Samina Project, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. And in these three pictures, he and I, and on the far right, the farrier, Steve O'Grady, are teaching a course in the Dominican Republic. Uh, this is the empowering the care providers part. In this picture, uh, on the upper left are, is a veterinarian teaching technicians in Ethiopia. The gentleman in the middle is one of our helpers in the Dominican Republic, as is uh, his colleague on the bottom right. Um, and then uh, upper right, lower left, we're giving anesthesia preparation for surgery. On the lower left, we're doing literally getting ready to do abdominal surgery. Uh, in a clearing, a uh, little different environment than we would do up here. Bottom, we're assisting a horse getting up out of anesthesia. So educating local caregivers, educating equals empowering. This includes veterinarians. Again, this is Ethiopia. Um, it, it includes the owners and users, and it includes veterinary students. The uh, man under the in the veterinary students picture in the pale blue short sleeve shirt is Professor uh, Derek Nottenbelt from the University of Liverpool. So this re this really is a global initiative. Um, one of the things that struck me immediately upon my first visit was if this is going to be sustainable, the owners and the caregivers locally have to buy into it. And I'll speak now mostly to the Dominican Republic, but this is true kind of across the board. 
there's a generational difference. Um, and there's also patriarchy that comes into it. A lot of these cultures are patriarchal cultures. Um, it's the adult males who essentially set the tone for attitude and for aspirations. So we found in the Dominican Republic that history played an important role. There still are people, quite a few, very elderly now, alive in the Dominican Republic who remember the, the terrible years of the Trujillo dictatorship, which ended in 1961 uh, with the dictator's assassination. But during his tenure, <clears throat> so-called disappearances were very, very common. And as a result, even to this day, when we would approach uh, local farmers who go back to that area or recall bits of that area, communication was very difficult. We were not one of them. And uh, for them to commit to a day or a time when they would be there uh, in decades past might mean they, they would be taken and never brought back. So where do you get empathy? Well, you get it with the young people, the young people. If you look at this, at these pictures carefully. These are young, young kids on the left, their mother bringing them out, uh, upper right, uh, clustered around the donkey I'm about to work on. And they, they uh, are very interested. And interestingly, when you knock the animal down and start the cutting with the scalpel and there's some blood and so on, these kids don't blink. Uh, there's no squeamishness, there's no, uh, squealing, there's no leaving the scene, they just watch. And I said to uh, one of our Dominican helpers, I said, that's interesting in the States, a lot of times kids won't stay and watch this. And he said, you must understand, they've seen their mothers and their sisters die in childbirth. He said, this is not the United States. Um, so it's a very different culture. And that's really important for anybody getting involved because you have to put aside your preconceptions and your own experience with your own culture. So empathy, building empathy in the children, in my opinion, and, and I know others share this, is absolutely essential. Um, here, this is in Mauritania, where a Equitarian Initiative teacher has a group of young children and is, and is helping them understand that these animals are living creatures. They're not commodities like a tractor or a truck. Again, this young man, this is in the, in the Fez, Morocco, um, uh, with his animal. These are more children from the Dominican Republic. If you look at them gathered around the animals or holding their animals, the, Little chap in the upper right, he's keeping the head down on an animal on his donkey about to come out of anesthesia. These are some more of the kids. They're, they're just look at them holding, holding those animals, the two puppies and the horse. These kids love these animals. And because they're not carrying with them the baggage of past decades, when when living in the DR politically was a terrible experience. They're open to they're open to people encouraging this empathy. I love this little guy on the left, and and these dogs, by the way, were were rescued and treated by the small animal contingent of the Dominican Republic Veterinary Project. But these are the these to me are the answer to the sustainability question. Uh, in Ethiopia, the kids are all given a poster that says this. And they relate to this. This is something they can understand, they relate. We're very grateful to the Equitarian Initiative, to our many partners, and, and uh, it's my understanding this is not at this point a complete list, but um, you can see a couple major pharmaceutical houses on there, the AA American Association of Equine Practitioners and others. And they all fit under this, under, as a consortium under the equine or equitarian initiative. So why do we need to care? What are the reasons other than just emotional? Human life relies on animals 
uh, the people in these developing world in the developing world depend on these animals and these animals depend on them. Animal welfare is our, should be our concern. Again, this is, a, this is a more complex issue than just be kind to animals. Disease and accident injury treatments are essential for these animals. These, these are the, the life of the families, the human families, but there's very little veterinary support for equids. In many places, there is none. There are over 200 million families relying on working equids in Saharan Africa alone. And you can see the different jobs they do here. Plus, you can add to that Sub-Saharan, Europe, Asia, South Central America, India. So it's a staggering population. We talked about their roles for transport and their relief of the human burden. They don't, they don't uh, totally relieve it, but they mitigate the, the burden on human beings. So what stops them from working? Well, the big three are disease, injury, and malnutrition. And, these, and all three of these are very, very common in the developing world. They're almost a given sooner or later for any one of these working equids. You look at that one on the upper right, is still working. But what if the animal does not work? Well, the family starves. Now this is a grandfather and his grandson, and I'm gonna come back to him in a second and share a little story with you. Children can't go to school. I don't know how old that little girl is, but look at her hauling a, a full water jug. Women and children do the donkey work for, like it or not, in a lot of these cultures, they are patriarchal, as I said before. And when the donkey goes down, the women and children pick up the slack as best they can. The pressures on the families in these developing world countries are immense. And I dare say, not speaking for any of you, but certainly for myself, whatever bumps in the road I've experienced, they're totally irrelevant to what these people deal with every day. This is a concept I had difficulty grasping for a little bit in the beginning, but I came to know that it is true and that there is a difference between cruel conditions and cruelty. The conditions are cruel but they're not imposed by cruelty. They're imposed by starvation and overwork, which come out of poverty, necessity, and ignorance. This animal, that's his right eye, this working equid, that's his right eye. It's been traumatized. If the trauma has become infected, there's a discharge. The reason it matters that it's his right eye is if you go to these countries and you see a hundred such ocular trauma cases, 85 of those hundred are gonna be the right eye, not the left eye. And here's why. About 85% or more of their handlers are right-handed and they're very free with the whip. The men are. And when they're not paying attention, uh, they'll hit that eye. And is that cruel? Well, certainly it, it, it is cruel, but someone needs to educate these, uh, these drivers, these owners, and, and they learn, they do learn, but, the, but their behavior is traditional. It's handed down generation after generation. So society may perceive them as barbaric, cruel, inhumane, and take the, draw the conclusion, so leave them to it, let them deal with their own situation or try to understand and help. Most communities, most developing world communities, I would say the vast majority would like to do better for their animals. They know that their animals are vital to their own lives. They've been using, if that's the word, animals for far longer than we have. They understand animals. 
and they live in harsh and unforgiving places under harsh survivor condi survival conditions themselves. So let me spend a moment or two on the brick kilns of North Africa. Of all the environmental challenges that working equits face globally, probably none are greater than the brick kilns of North Africa. And these are not new. This is not a new industry. This is the wall, one of the walls of the Vatican you can see built in AD 40. So these kilns have been active for millennia and they are totally dependent among other things on the labor of donkeys. They're also dependent on the labor of not just men, but women and children, as you can see in these pictures. These are all brick kilns around Cairo. Um, the body conditions of these working equids is very, very uh, minimal. If you look at the upper left, uh, the loads they carry are maximal. If you look at the lower right, they carry on their back, they pull by draft. The heat in these circumstances, in these brick kilns is intense. The ground surface is very irregular, hard, it's rough. And if you look at the people at the top center, again, the, the people are in the same conditions as the working equids. Their, their, their lives are in extreme, extremely difficult circumstances themselves. And if you look at the load on that donkey on the upper right and this poor animal on the lower right that is down on its knees now. But then look in the center bottom and look at that man's feet. They're, he's barefoot. Immediately in front of him is a fire in the kiln. Well, of course, that's how the kilns make the bricks. I think this picture <clears throat> uh, is important to point out. When we go to the Dominican Republic, it's, it's almost a given that we take a brand new pair of sneakers with us because we spend one week in the rainforest, sloshing through mud, sometimes streams. The, the sneakers get dirty, it's hot, it's humid. They never dry out. And we literally wear them out at the end of one week. Here's a pair of discarded sneakers from the, from the Dominican. The, the last day as we're leaving the rainforest to go down to the town of Samana, we find a place and the locals know we're gonna do this. We find a place where no one is around because for pride sake, they don't want to be seen picking up used sneakers. And then we'll all throw our sneakers in one pile, keep on driving. And those sneakers are gone in a few minutes once we're out of sight. And I, I wonder what this man on the left, how much he would appreciate a pair of dirty used up old sneakers like that probably he would be very appreciative. <clears throat> Back in the brick kilns, some other images. In the center is a hoof that no doubt has, has probably never seen a proper hoof trim. The animal's still working. If you look at the head, check down on the animal on the right in an attempt to shift some of the load forward over the four quarters. And some of them simply don't make it. At the bottom, you have one that uh, is down and, and highly unlikely will get up and, one on, and the same with the one on the right. These are tough environments. So let me talk to you a little bit about Project Samana. This is the project in the Dominican Republic. The DR is the second poorest country in the Western hemisphere second only to its neighbor, contiguous neighbor to the, to the west, that's Haiti. The peninsula outlined in red is the Samana Peninsula, where in the rainforest, the typical income for families with a working equity is $3 per day. The people are Spanish speaking. There are marked generational differences. I mentioned the Trujillo years. The religion is a mix of Roman Catholic traditions and West African religions. 
uh, specifically Santeria, and this has implications when it comes to euthanasia. In 2017, 21 people just in the Samana Peninsula died of tetanus. 2018, four people died of rabies. And there are not that many people on the Samana Peninsula. So this is the level of human preventive medicine, wealth, uh, health, uh, wellness care, whatever we want to call it that you deal with. So uh, the, the Project Samana brings doctors of veterinary medicine and techs and students and, and even horsemen from all over the world, students from many schools. And we bring in local veterinarians, techs, interpreters, and helpers. These are just some scenes from the rainforest area of Samana. The, the, on the upper left, that's the kitchen area of a, of a family's home. Lower right would be the home itself. Um, lower left, the lady is cooking a meal on one of the stoves. If you look at the upper right, that's completely made out of clay, a very, very white clay that they gather, molded into whatever they want, mortars, pestles, stoves, ranges, and everything, of course, is cooked on firewood. Um, some of the little children that, that live there, and then a young man on below getting ready to bring horses as they put it on the day the doctors come. So here is the day the doctors come. Uh, they might show up with one, they might show up with a half a dozen. They bring them in, uh, leave them in hand, uh, usually hold them, but if they can find a stout enough tree, they'll tie to that, donkeys, horses, a few mules. Um, there's usually a, a sometimes self-appointed uh, supervisor. And this is one, one clearing and a couple of things I'd point out. If you look at the machete, all the men and boys carry a machete. And it's very helpful to us because we need, a, we need the, the bush and the brush and the grass cut down where we wanna knock the horses down under anesthesia. And these guys are just, it's unbelievable what they, what, half a dozen men with a machete can do. It looks like a John Deere trimmed it in a few minutes. The other thing you'd note is around the head and neck or around the neck are the many coils of, of rope. And they don't, these animals are not fenced in, they're tethered. Sometimes they're even let loose. And, and that's a problem. Uh, much of the surgery we do down there is to castrate. Uh, the lifespan of a gelding castrated early in life in the DR is 12 or 13 years. Left the stallion, it's three to five years. They fight, of course, as stallions do. Rabies is endemic, tetanus is endemic. And so castration is a very, very important investment for the, the welfare of these animals and their families. So here's another day the doctors come. You can see uh, groups of people or sometimes single owners come. The bottom right shows the back of the pickup truck with our, some medical supplies. So uh, a lot of what I did down there was anesthesia. Now this horse in the upper left, if that horse came to our clinic in Connecticut, when I was in practice and needed an elective surgery, not an emergency, but an elective surgery, I would have said, well, take your horse home, deworm it, feed it, bring it back in six weeks. We don't have that option down there. So you wind up crossing your fingers and, uh, and uh, doing the best you can with some patients that you're very worried about as far as their ability to withstand anesthesia. You also, if you're the anesthetist, you get one chance to pop a needle in. Um, these guys have never had a needle. And if you hit it on the first shot, you're okay. They'll make it real tough for you to have a second chance. And the horse in the upper right, that's my friend, Steve O'Grady. Um, he's going in for a second opportunity and the horse is behaving like all of them do down there. He's saying, no, no, uh, I didn't like that at all. <clears throat> Help is very much needed. If you look closely at this horse below his left ear, you can see a massive abscess. Who knows how long that's been there. Look at the lower 
I'm sorry, the left hind leg on this horse, this is that case of um, epizootic lymphangitis, uh, way, way, way beyond the point of helping, but the people not allowing euthanasia. Uh, when you broach the subject of euthanasia in the DR, and this is true in, a, in a, quite a few of the, of the Western Hemisphere Spanish speaking countries, you will be, the response will be, uh, no, el señor, el señor. Well, in that context, el señor means God. And the message is God will take care of it. Which sooner or later, someone takes care of it. But in the meantime, the horses is, is uh, I should say something takes care of it. The horses don't get uh, euthanasia when they need it. Here's the horse I showed you with the fused and deformed left hind leg. This horse is still working, pulling coconuts. Uh, horse on the bottom right, big neck wound, wounds across the back. This is all from ill-forming tack. Now here's this gentleman I told you we would come back to. Um, I don't know how old he is. That's his grandson. He has his arm around him. They brought their four-year-old donkey colt to be castrated. And uh, as I said, I was doing the anesthesia, I didn't speak Spanish, but through, the, through our assistant, our Dominican assistant, he said, he wants, the old man wants to tell you something. I said, what is that? He said, he wants you to please be careful. He wants you to know if he dies, meaning the grandfather, he himself. If he dies, his family will go on. He has sons. If they lose their donkey, they may starve. Up to that point, I was not casual about the anesthesia, but I treated it pretty much as I would up here. Uh, I confess paying an awful lot of attention to that particular case, but that is a truth that we never have to confront up here. I always remember that. I think in those few seconds that man captured a great deal of what it's like to work in these countries and what these people deal with. So here's a, a, a fly. <clears throat> this is a very nasty, as far as horse, as far as livestock go, insect called a screw worm. That's its larval form. These are ubiquitous in many tropical countries and especially the Dominican Republic. Any wound, scrape, scratch is a target for screw worms. This is the distal end of the of the penis on a on a horse. Uh, invaded by larvae. This is the mane of a horse invaded by larvae. These things will get into wounds, secretions, wherever, and there will be the, the, the cause of death of, of many of the working equids. Ticks as well, uh, in the eyes, under the tail, around the genital area, in the inguinal area. Uh, Truthfully, I, I don't remember seeing a horse, donkey, or mule without some tick infestation. Bits and tack. If you look closely at some of these bits, they have no business being in a horse's mouth. Uh, you look at the length on the curbs on these bits. Some of them are hand forged. Some of them have wire, sometimes even barbed wire between the, the braces on the bits. Um, <clears throat> And people are amenable to making the changes, but they they need it pointed out to them. Um, these are two animals that carried tourists. And you look how skinny they are. There is no such thing as proper fitting tack if you're gonna put this kind of weight on their backs. And they have no choice. They have to show up for work and they work all day. Keep in mind, they're, they're earning about $3 a day for their families. Some more bits and tack wounds. You can see skinny, you can see overload, you can see a sore at the withers. You can see a mismatch between the rider and, and, the, and the rider's mount. Farriery. Farriery in the DR is as it is in virtually all of these developing world countries. Farriery is whatever it takes. This is a foot that's been torn apart. 
and they do the best they can. This, this is uh, hard to know how many horses that horseshoe at the bottom and why it's shaped the way it is, how many times it's been used. Look at the nails in it. Um, rubber tires are the best they can do for a pad. They'll hand hammer the nails uh, and get it on as best they can. And actually that one on the bottom right, that's a pretty good job given the instruments and materials the farrier had to work with. So we spend a fair amount of time on farrier demonstrations. Again, this is my colleague, Steve O'Grady. Limb deformity. So that's an osteoarthritis of the left carpal joint. Um, there, there's not much you can do for that other than take it out of work, which isn't an option. But this is an angular limb deformity. That's a, an angular limb deformity. And these are, these are operable when the animals are young and they're not complicated surgeries, but they don't happen down there. So these creatures continue to work with, uh, with what they've got. So opportunities, education. We try to educate them in husbandry, in injury prevention and treatment, in disease prevention uh, and treatment and about nutrition and dental care. Dental care is virtually non-existent. Every horse we see, we vaccinate against rabies and tetanus um, and we check the teeth while it's under anesthesia. I mentioned this fact before, um, this would be unheard of in the United States or any, really any Western country. This is a horse that in the DR that we saw that had rabies. Um, the quote refers to an email that came in. She, in this case, is our, one of our liaisons in Samana, a woman who volunteers her time. She put her hand in the mouth, trying to see why it had a swollen mouth and then had to go get the post-exposure treatment. Fortunately, she survived, but this is all the same horse. Uh, in the final throes of, of rabies. Again, tetanus is another, another uh, issue down there. Do interventions help? Yes, simple vaccination helps. Uh, Epsoidic uh, lymphang uh, lymphangitis, we can't, I'm sorry, enzoatic lymphangitis, we can't vaccinate against it, but we can treat it early. So wound prevention, parasite control, harness bits, those are all, we can remedy these things through education and simple preventive measures. So what is the solution? Well, some people would say, oh, it's an easy solution. Make poverty history, get rid of the animals, give everybody a machine and, let, and leave them to it. Well, there's a bigger picture here. Which of these two transporters is, is a bigger problem for the world's future? I would suggest the one on the left. Which of these two dead transporters, former transporters is a problem, bigger problem? I'd suggest the one on the right. Here's a farmer uh, in East Africa. Would he be better off with a John Deere? Where's he gonna buy the fuel for it, the parts? Uh, so does the world need 200 million new machines to replace the, the working equids? Where does the fuel come from? How does it get distributed to these remote areas? How do people buy it? They're making $3 a day. Where do the parts come from? So we believe in the years to come, there will be more working animals, working equids, not less. But as you can see from the picture, there's an inevitable conflict between these machines and the animals. These are the perfect employee for these areas for all, the, for all these reasons. We feel that caring people must get involved. These animals are here to stay. Hundreds of millions of people rely totally on them. They are sustainable as a resource and they're very, very environmentally kind. So is it acceptable that therefore that they die, suffer from preventable disease? 
or that their people suffer when the donkey dies or can't work and the people live with the threat of zoonotic disease. We do not approve of an approach that offers gratuitous ill-informed criticism or failure to understand that they have to live and work under these conditions, a failure to grasp the extent of their poverty, to recognize their necessities in life, and probably most important, failing to recognize their dignity and pride. Without that final uh, recognition, it's virtually impossible to educate and to encourage empathy. Owning an equity releases women and children, facilitates their own social development, increases family income fivefold, adds to the family's recognition and stature within the community. And over the next 10 years, this population could easily double. So the Equitarian Initiative asks, can we help this lad do better for his horse, his family and himself? Again, we believe we can through hands-on help to the animals, education of their owners and their handlers. And that's what you're seeing here. This is all a sustainable investment. These are the folks that we aim to help. Uh, I will tell you they're among the most gracious and grateful and in most cases, optimistic people, especially given the conditions uh, under which they live. Can we really close our minds to the need to help? Well, at the equestrian, I'm sorry, at the Equitarian Initiative, we feel the answer to that is no, we, we, we need to keep our minds open to the need to help. And these are the, people and the animals were, we uh, strive to help. So thank you very much, Holly, uh, friends of Cossett Library and for the great people at the Equitarian Initiative. And um, I would suggest if you're interested, go to this website, the equitarianinitiative.org. I think you'll find a, a lot of great information. And at the bottom is my email if you have any questions or concerns about this just send me an email i'll be more than happy to have a dialogue with you or do what i can to help you so thank you all very much for attending well thank you very much harry this was really a fascinating look at um at at this organization and what you folks are doing um with the uh with all these working equids around the world. And particularly, I guess your experience is mostly with the Dominican Republic. I noticed that was... Um... Well, my hands-on experience is with the Dominican Republic, but I've, I'm uh, involved in our American Association of Equine Practitioners has a foundation, a philanthropic arm. And I'm involved in the foundation's work in specifically in the area of equitarian grants. So I get the chance, it's an opportunity. I had my opportunities to travel. I may, I may yet wind up um, traveling again to the developing world, we'll see. But in the meantime, I, I uh, get to serve on, on a group that uh, reviews requests for funding uh, for these purposes, which is gratifying. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Warner before uh, before our program ends today? Because I, I think people were mesmerized by what you were um, showing and explaining through the course of the uh, program. Um, I don't have anything in our chat uh, window for questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, I know you said that the children the children are. Um, capable of watching all the blood and the guts and the gory bits and pieces. And I think for folks that are in the medical profession, they're probably used to it, but some of those images were rather moving. So um, I, I um, haven't seen, I personally haven't seen um, horses.
and mules or donkeys that have really had to, um, you know, bear the brunt of those those workloads that they had, and then the injuries or the um, infections and diseases that they were fighting off. It was it was it was really an eyeful. It's hard to it's hard to present this topic, um, and I think it would be wrong to present this topic in a in a light manner, in an uplifting manner, because it's it's not a light topic. It's a right. It, it simply isn't. And I think you, you, uh, you know, images, pictures, images convey a lot of information. And I think it was important to at least include some of the, maybe the more dramatic ones. I have a question. Yes. Um, it's Peggy LaRoe with a question about whether in the communities where equids are commonly used as a working animal, do they tend to have members of the community that are more knowledgeable about animals than others or is it every man for himself kind of yeah, that's a good question uh, first of all hi peggy um yeah yeah that's a good question and i would say that's a variable there are communities um for example in the in the dominican republic now the projects the project samana is a little over two decades old um the answer to that question 20 years ago would have been no. Ignorance is, uh, uh, ignorance is, is well entrenched and uniform. But through Project Samina, certain uh, younger people, young men, have been taught how to trim a foot without crippling the horse, um, for example. And uh, we've taught them quite a few of them safe handling techniques. Again, these are not pets. These are horses who uh, always have their radar out. Um, and so we've taught them how to do, how to safely examine the animal for certain uh, suspect injuries or illnesses. Um, and, and so I would say a lot of the communities are that way in Central America, that's also true. Um, when you get into areas where communities are, are uh, sparsely populated and widely separated, and this is true in some areas of East Africa, the, um, it's more or less everybody for themselves. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harry. That was uh, excellent information. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll have more questions coming up. Um, I had a, a thought cross my mind a couple of times. Um, the pandemic, how has that impacted, to your knowledge, how has the pandemic impacted the delivery of services for the working equids? Well, it disrupted it uh, because uh, it's a long bus ride to the Dominican Republic. So as you, as you can imagine, air flight, you got you to fly to these places, almost all of them. There are some places in uh, the northern half of Mexico that are drivable, but um, the places that require air transport, they simply didn't get visits until it was safe and approved to get back on an airplane. Um, and uh, that's all resuming now. I talked to Dr. Merriam yesterday and there's a, I believe it's in May, May or June coming up. There's the, the, the trip resumed down to the, down to the Samana Peninsula. They do at least two a year there. Um, so it was disruptive. It was disruptive. <clears throat> One thing I didn't point out in my comment on is I showed you a list of NGOs, non-government organizations. That that business model, if you if you will, is very very important in this kind of work. Simply because if financial assistance is directed to the country itself, as opposed to sending in volunteers for the non-government organization. It's anybody's guess, it's a true wild card whether that assistance ever gets to where it's intended. And quite frankly, in most cases, at least 
it does not. And so I mention that because um, from time to time, people will say, well, I would like to help out here. And I always direct them to the, to the NGOs because there are government programs, purely government programs. And, and I would say they're uh, the security of, of uh, whatever a person volunteers to give, the security of that getting where it's targeted uh, is, is much greater with an NGO. That's a political aspect of it. Does anybody else have any questions tonight for Dr. Warner? All right. I'm 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 scrolling through. I'm scanning. I'm looking. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm waiting for uh, waiting for anyone waving a hand or unmuting or um, any of the above. Holly. Yes. Oh, hi, Marilyn. Hi there. And Dr. Uh, Warner, I would just um, say thank you and hope that you can extend it to the people who recommended this program that are, I don't know if they're part of the Horse Council or if it's a veterinary um, consortium or, or whomever, but I, I wish more people were here to see this type of programming, especially during this pandemic when everyone here just wants to help everyone that the awareness is key to um, us as people. Well, thank, thank you. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's all about awareness. This is not a topic that's on the tip of everybody's tongue because they haven't come across it, um, most people. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I should, uh, so thank you for bringing that up. And, and it's also a program that uh, I would be more than happy to present in any other venue if, if there was interest in it. Yeah, and how, Dr. Warner, how did you initially become involved? I mean, you retired, of course, but um, say a veterinarian somewhere in the United States or in Connecticut or whatever thought, oh, I love this idea. How might I get involved or something? Well, um, how did you become involved? Uh, yeah, I became involved through the um, American Association of Equine Practitioners, where, mm -hmm. where I had the pleasure of being able to be active in that for quite a few years. And we would, um, we would travel for mm -hmm. the AAP. I was on their executive committee. That took us to... Europe, Western Europe took us to Hungary, took us to South America, East Africa, um, Australia. So we got to uh, Central America. We got to go to places where there were other horse doctors. And when you go to those places, uh, Mexico is a good example. Mexico has a real dichotomy in horses as a, as a number of these other countries do. They have some of the finest in the world as far as show horses go. But the vast majority of equids in Mexico are donkeys plowing along trying to make a few bucks for their owner like you saw tonight. So we would go to these places and find that the equid population was very different than it was here in Connecticut. And simply by meeting colleagues or fellow horse doctors and hearing their story, um, I want to say probably 20, 21 years ago, I was asked to speak at, in Veracruz, New Mex or Veracruz, Mexico, at their annual horse doctors meeting. And I'll always remember it. And this is probably the, the one episode that maybe really got me going on this. Um, they did a surgical demonstration. Uh, a veterinarian, veterinary surgeon from Paraguay did a colostomy of all things on mm -hmm. a pony. Only took him about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, the next day they got the pony up and he reversed it, hitched, hooked him back together. And I said to him, of all the things you could demonstrate <laughs> at this meeting, why in the world would you pick a colostomy yeah. and his answer was remarkable he said in 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 Paraguay he said the government if you have a working equid 
the government pays for any veterinary care. Number two, there's very little for them to eat, for these equids to eat. And so they'll be tethered in a, in a, by the town dump or somewhere. And the next thing you know, they've eaten three or four plastic bags because there was a few breadcrumbs in there. So he said, believe it or not, a colostomy in Paraguay for, for a working equid is there's actually a demand for it at yeah. some level. Yeah. And I remember thinking, good God, you know, here's a whole chunk of the horse world I never dreamed about. And mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those subjects that the more I looked into it, the more I felt that I didn't want my time to run out without having tried to, in some way, uh, affect it in a positive manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very admirable. So. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Marilyn, for thank asking. You. And I do know we've had, um, Gwendolyn has been very patient. She's had her hand up and she's waiting to ask a question. So Gwendolyn, I know you're already unmuted. I can hear you out there. And if you'd like to um, ask your question, now's the time. <laughs> sure. Um, <clears throat> I actually had the pleasure of having a high school internship with Harry where I went with him uh, on Wednesdays instead of going to school. And I was thrilled <laughs> to hear that he's done this because I didn't know that. Um, as somebody here um, in the pandemic, getting my second shot in a week or two, I'm just curious as to, does he have suggestions in addition to going to equitarianinitiative.org as to what we can do here to help this program? Um, to, to help the Equitarian Initiative itself? Yes, it, and or any of the other ones that you had. Um, yeah, well, if you, go to the, if you go to the Equitarian Initiative website, you will see listed the NGOs. And okay. I, my, my answer to you would be, do look at the Equitarian website thoroughly there will be sections on what you can do. Volunteer, uh, I think there's four modes of, something like four modes of action opportunity. One, of course, to be perfectly blunt, one, of course, is, is to help fund something, but that's not my mission tonight. But that is part of the answer to your question. So if you go to that website, and then if you, and then when you're, when you've looked at what Equitarian is attempting to direct you toward, then on that website are the NGOs, the Donkey Sanctuary, okay. the Brook Animal Care, Egypt, World Horse uh, Welfare, etc. Look at each of those because some of these. Uh, some of these NGOs are pretty restrictive as to let's let's say you're interested in in uh, packing a bag and traveling and holding an IV jug or or helping a horse in a field get up out of anesthesia. Some of these groups are pretty restrictive. Others not quite as restrictive. And if that's where your interests are. Um, you should be able to find what opportunities there are by going through the, the different websites. Um, is, am I answering you? You certainly are, and I thank you very much. Sure. Is there going to be some things to do? <laughs> and again, if you if you if you come up against uh, you, if you can't get where you think you want to want to get uh, get back to me through my website I'll, I'll track you down and see if I can help you absolutely thank you so much and thank you on behalf of the equids everywhere for the You're, help that you've given them it is a pleasure okay um, let's see do we have anyone else in the uh, group that has a question um, we'll probably if we do this will probably be our last one and we'll start wrapping up I know that uh, Dr. Werner is very graciously offered to be available to anyone with any additional questions after the fact. Uh, Marilyn, go ahead. I have another question. Um, I um, Are these questions being recorded as well in your programming? 
perfect. Yeah. Right now I've got the whole business <laughs> being recorded. I can stop the recording at any moment if you would like me <laughs> no, to. No, I was that. just wondering, it doesn't matter. Um, when will this be um, viewable by grabby people and by people if I wanted, if it comes as a link and I wanted to, um, cause it's very interesting information. It's fascinating. If I wanted to have it uh, viewable by other people. So typically what happens is it takes me about 48 hours or less to mm -hmm. get the item uh, downloaded, converted, and posted to the library's YouTube channel. Okay. And typically what I will do is when it's ready to rock and roll, <laughs> um, I post something on the library's Facebook page with the YouTube channel link so that people yeah. can find it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, and, and oftentimes what I'll do is send a group email to you folks that have attended and let you know that it's available too. However, usually most of the people that have attended the program probably don't want to watch it again unless that they're unless yeah. they're using it for <laughs> reference purposes. But um, so uh, yeah, we try to uh, make it available. Of course, the YouTube Granby Public Library YouTube channel. If you were to Google that, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the videos from a lot of the programs that we've done are posted there, and people yeah. can watch them at any time. But this one should be up. See, today's Wednesday. Um, I'm sure I'll have it up by Friday. Mm -hmm. so, um, but okay. I, I can, Marilyn, I can also send you a separate link. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm only thinking, you know, whether friends or spouses. I have a friend that's no longer in the area, but uh, she raised horses and daughter is a veterinarian. So um, I think it's worth sending information about viewing the program. Thank you. Oh, I, I think yeah. so too. I mean, this is a, it's just a um, fascinating topic. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a movement. It's, it's an initiative. Um, it's, it's just really something that as we go through our lives every day, we may not even mm -hmm. be aware of. And lo and behold, there's, you know, millions of folks and millions of these animals that are, are being helped and uh, yeah. by, by, by all these volunteers. So I think it's just a tremendous initiative. And I am really delighted that tonight we had Dr. Werner here to share his experience and his knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad for the folks that attended. Thank you so much for being here. It was wonderful that you were able to find the time in your day. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to reference back to the program, um, don't hesitate to look for it on the Granby Public Library YouTube channel.